Okay, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to Grand Rounds. Today we have the uh, privilege of listening to Dr. Warner from the <laughs> Warner Mammalist Lab talked about some of the calcifications after intracameral injections of air, and these are some of the lenses that we're currently using in the United States, so it should be very applicable to a lot of the people in the room here today. So, Dr. Warner, thanks. Thank you very much, and good morning. So actually today, um, there will be this presentation about these cases, which is going to last around 15 to 20 minutes. And then we actually have two videos we want to show to you. These are videos we did in our lab. One we sent to meetings last year, and the other one we sent to meetings this year. So we're starting with the presentation. <coughs> so calcification of hydrophilic acrylic lenses is not something really new. And at this point in our laboratory, we already analyzed hundreds and hundreds of these lenses, and we published, I don't even know how many papers about that. So before I go into the current problem, I want to give you a small background on the calcification uh, issue. So mostly the cases were related to four major designs, all manufactured in the United States. And in the case of the Hydroview by Bausch and Lomb, you had this calcium deposit all around the optic on the surface of the lens. And you see you can use some histochemical uh, techniques to show calcium. For example, von Cossa, we stain calcium in black. Elisa in red, we stain calcium in red. You can also use surface analysis to demonstrate the elemental composition of deposits. Here we use energy dispersive X-ray spectroscopy to show calcium and phosphate on the deposits. What I want to highlight is that here you see that the deposits are all on the surface of the lens everywhere, anterior surface, posterior surface, and lateral wall. With the memory lens by Cibovision, and many of these lenses were explanted in the United States, you had more or less the same thing. You had a thin granularity covering the entire optic surface of the lens. So anterior surface, posterior surface, everywhere. Again, we confirm calcium and phosphate. With this lens manufactured by MDR, the case was slightly different. The calcium deposits was were mostly within the substance of the lens. But again, what I want to highlight is that they are close to the surface, anterior surface, posterior surface, lateral walls, so really everywhere. And to make this analysis, we had to cut the lens in half and analyze the inside of the lens. But again, they are not exactly localized, they are everywhere. And we analyzed many aquasense, and with this lens, the calcium deposits were literally everywhere. They were on the surface of the optic, haptics, within the substance of the lens, optic and haptic, everywhere. You can see here, anterior surface, posterior surface, lateral walls, everywhere. And another thing that's important to know is that in these cases, the calcification would be observed from two years to many years after cataract surgery with intraocular lens implantation. So that's what we used to call dystrophic calcification. So this being said, let us come back to the problem at hand. And as you know, uh, there are different posterior lamellar keratoplasty techniques that um, have some advantages over conventional corneal graft to deal with corneal endothelial dysfunction. And these techniques have been very successfully used in pseudophagy patients with associated Fuchs dystrophy or to deal with pseudophagy corneal edema. But then, since 2010, we started receiving in our, our laboratory different hydrophilic acrylic lenses that were explanted because of calcification, and all of them had this very specific pattern of calcification that actually was very different from what I told you in my background. And uh, all of them, we checked the history, and they were explanted after the SAC or such corneal procedures. So that we found that very interesting. And we published many cases, uh, mostly case reports initially on those uh, cases. But what I would like to do today is summarize the seven first cases which recently appeared in the January issue of the Journal of Cataract and Refractive Surgery. But since then, we received even other lenses. So this summarizes the cases, but we'll go slowly through this table. 
So basically we had three cases from the United States and four international cases from three countries. So I want to highlight that these are also touching lenses that are available in the United States, so you may be seeing that. The patients were aged at around 71 years at implantation, five women, two men. The lenses were implanted between January 2003 and January 2012. In two cases, the cataract surgery with IOL implantation was done together with the DSEC procedure, and one of, that, uh, one of those patients had a DSEC prior to cataract surgery, so repeated procedures. The IOL pacification was first noticed between one and 16 months after the last DSEC procedure with intracameral injection of air or gas. So the mean, if you remove one case that was um, longer than the others, is at around 5.5 months. So this is really shorter in comparison to what we used to call this trophic calcification. That usually would take two years or even more to form. And uh, in all the cases, there was increasing visual acuity and foggy vision. But it's very interesting, the lens is so pacified and you would expect a huge decrease in the visual acuity, but in the majority of the cases, that was not really happening. But the symptoms were dominated by glare visibility because of surface light, light scattering from the calcification. So um, the lenses were explanted between 2007 and August 2013. Two lenses had to be explanted within the entire capsular bag because there were at this point attachments between the lens and the capsular bag. And in all cases, the vision function significantly improved. And there are six different IOL designs by five different manufacturers. So you have to know that all hydrophilic acrylic lenses are not the same. The materials are different. So that means that these cases are not having a preference towards a material or a design or a manufacturer. And what we used to call this trophic calcification, the great majority of the cases had a preference towards four specific lenses. So in all cases, there was Fuchs dystrophy, just not one. And this is very important too. There was one <coughs> DSEC associated procedures in four cases, but in the majority of them with repeated intracameral injections of air or gas. And there were at least two procedures in three cases. So repetition of injections and different procedures seems to be very important <coughs> here. So here you have some clinical photographs. And what is interesting is that the calcification is really localized to the anterior surface of the lenses in all cases in a round pattern that seems to match the opening of the capsulorexis or the opening of the pupil. And then you don't have calcification in other areas of the anterior surface, and you don't have calcification on the posterior surface. And you have here the cases we analyzed first, and again, all in the center. And in these two cases here, it's very interesting because it's slightly eccentric. And then we check the clinical photos, and the patients had eccentric pupils. So it really matches the opening of the pupil or the capsulorexis. Here you have the two cases explanted within the capsular bag, so again, very localized in the center. And I mean, in all these cases, the, the plate of calcification is really very thick. It's like a multi-layer of calcification localized to that area. And again, in some of these cases, there was a bit of decrease in visual acuity, but that was not the major problem. The major problem was glare, disability, and foggy vision. So I wanted to show this case, the entire analysis with the histochemical analysis, so you can have an impression of how thick this actually is. It's like a plaque of calcification with a multi-layer of deposits, staining very nicely with Elysium red, and you see that they are uh, at a small distance from the rex's edge, so they are limited to this round area. And in our lab, we have a model artificial eye and a shine through camera that we can use to measure surface light scattering. And the surface scattering at the level of this plate of calcification is extremely high. It's 228 CCT versus 13 in a control lens. So the majority of the symptom, symptoms of the patient is really because of the um, light scattering. And with this concossa, we have sections cut through the lens that was explanted within the capsular bag. 
and we could confirm that the deposits are only on the anterior surface and when you go to higher magnification you see only on the anterior surface with an extension to the subsurface and all the cases are exactly the same. So now we, uh, since this publication we received many different cases and I wanted to highlight this publication because these two lenses here are particularly interesting. First of all, this is the Sulcoflex by Rainer. This is a supplementary IOL and this is the very first case ever of calcification of this design. This lens has been in the market since many years and um, this lens is put in the sulcos as a piggyback lens to deal with some refractive issue and you see how limited to the central area this is. This was limited by the pupil. So again, the very first case of this, and uh, in this case, the eye had the SAC procedures and uh, the MAC procedures actually, and repeated injections of air and gas. And this other lens is particularly interesting because in Europe, Zeiss and some other manufacturers, they have these hydrophilic acrylic lenses that they, uh, they uh, do a surface treatment on these lenses to render the surface of the lens hydrophobic. So many people there have this security, this security feeling that, okay, this lens has a hydrophobic surface, this is not going to calcify. And this paper clearly shows that that's really not the case. So particularly important. So there is increasing evidence in the literature of a distinctive pattern of calcification of different hydrophilic acrylic lens designs following procedures using these intracameral injections of air and gas. Calcification is always on the anterior surface, subsurface, in the center within the pupillary or the capsular axis area, which means the area that's in direct contact with the anterior chamber contents. And in all cases, there was poor quality of vision. There is nothing else you can do. You really have to explant. And other groups describe the same findings. And um, the great majority of localized calcification <coughs> in the literature and also in what we analyze in our lab, there's always some multiple intracameral injections that were performed. So I checked the literature and I found this paper showing that um, this is a study evaluating the clinical, clinical outcomes after 500 consecutive cases of DMAC, and the rate of graft detachments can be as high as 21.6% within a six month follow up. So to have to perform reinjection or rebubbling as they call is not something really that uncommon. And this paper was published last year. It's interesting because it's a retrospective review from a single center of all patients undergoing the SAC, patients who were pseudophagic already or who had the SAC together with cataract surgeon and IOL implantation. So you have 168 cases in 154 eyes and 137 patients. For 54 of those had simultaneous cataract surgery. So the rate of calcification was found as close as 10% which is really high because when I provided you the background of this trophic calcification, even though in our laboratory we analyze hundreds and hundreds of lenses is because they are sent to us. But according to the companies, considering the number of lenses implanted, the overall rate of calcification is something not even close to 1%. So this is really much higher. And it seems that the risk factor, the rebubbling of detached, uh, detached endothelial grafts, so rebubbling was performed 62.5% in the cases with calcification compared to 23% with no calcification. <laughs> so the repeated procedures is something at risk. But gas and air is, uh, in injection in the, intra, uh, <coughs> in the anterior chamber is not only used after such procedures, we can use that in other situations. So this paper here described calcification, localized calcification of a hydrophilic acrylic lens after gas was used intracamerally to manage large iatrogenic decimates membrane detachments. So the calcification was observed just a few weeks after this injection. And this other paper here, and I, I co-author with them, some of the cases are not after the set. In uh, one case, the IOL calcification after intracameral injection uh, was used, uh, was occurring after intracameral injection of gas to control hypotony following uh, trabeculectomy. So it was not only after corneal procedures. 
But then we start questioning, is air or gas in the anterior chamber really the culprit here? Because we start reviewing the literature and start checking our series of lenses that we receive in the lab. And in the literature, there are some descriptions of a very similar pattern of hydrophilic acrylic lens calcification after a tissue plasminogen activator was used in the anterior chamber to dissolve fiber membranes after cataract surgery. It looks exactly the same when you see the photographs. And also in some cases, the patient had vitreous tamponade with gas or silicone oil. During vitrectomy, they had a hydrophilic acrylic lens and then it calcifies exactly in the same way. And in those cases, it's not like the gas and the silicone oil massively moved to the anterior chamber and was in contact with the lens. At yes? Was that, was that with the capsule intact? intact? Yeah. So even the capsule intact. That's the correct. thing. So um, maybe a small amount can migrate through the zonules and everything, but it's not a massive contact of that with the lens that's causing that. So we are raising all kinds of issues now. And then I want to show you the cases we found and the cases we are receiving and what we are dealing now. For example, this is another hydrophilic acrylic lens and the path it's explanted within the capsule bag. The pattern of calcification is exactly the same. In the history of the patient, the patient had an intravitreal anti-VGF uh, uh, and photocoagulation to deal with um, diabetic retinopathy and macular edema. In this case here, the patient had an Ahmed valve after cataract surgery. This is yet another hydrophilic acrylic lens. In these two cases here, uh, parts plan of vitrectomy and gas in the posterior segment was used to deal with the retinal detachment. So you see the pattern of cal calcification is exactly the same. And then there is this here. I don't think this lens was explanted yet, but the history of this patient involves chronic anterior uveitis and chronic use of steroids, and the patient had parsiplanar vitrectomy of gas to deal with macular holes, and in this one, the same thing, parsiplanar vitrectomy and gas to deal with retinal detachment. And again, it's not like a massive amount of air showed up in the anterior chamber was in contact with the lens. So, I mean, for the investigation, it's really necessary to determine if this localized calcification is a result of the direct contact between the IRL surface and the exogenous gas or substance. I do not really believe that anymore. Or if it is a metabolic change in the anterior chamber due to the presence of this gas or substance, or if it's just because there is exaggerated inflammatory reaction after multiple surgical procedures because all these eyes had repeated procedures, maybe a combination of these two factors. So the numbers, I mean, we analyze many of them, but the numbers are still very small. We cannot just say do not implant hydrophilic acrylic lenses. It's very difficult to do that. But what we are doing at the moment is just recommend, okay, if you have a patient that is going to undergo cataract surgery, has corneal <coughs> issues, and one day may require some corneal uh, procedures, you should not implant hydrophilic acrylic lenses in those particular eyes. So that's what we are recommending for the moment pending further research. So thank you for your attention on that. I'll be happy to answer any question, comments. Anything. It's varying water content, mm -hmm. it's varying surface treatment, it's just hydrophilic acrylic in general, and they all respond in the same way. It's this anterior calcification that's outlined by our respiratory approval, which is very strange, especially when you're looking at people who have had gas uh, posteriorly, and then, and I guess you're theorizing it's coming anteriorly, but it's, it's also not for sure. It's yeah. and yet the, mm -hmm. the calcification is not an appropriate because it's at its anterior surface, which is it's very puzzling. So just a couple of comments. Obviously, uh, uh, another example of why we're so proud of you and Nick and the work you do is this came out real fast. I mean, word went out thanks to you know Lillian really took the leadership on this thing. So well, around the world, I mean, people have taken notice of this. Um, there's been a lot of concern about hydrophilic acrylic lenses. Not very mm -hmm. popular here. They're very popular in Europe. And also very in popular. Know, yep. They, they are far and away the number one that's out there. Uh, the other thing about a lot of that easy to respond. Yeah. Um, 
some attachments form and everything. I remember so, that. Uh, we yeah. worked on that, and, and we ended up getting uh, somebody down in the chemistry department that who was uh, really good at this, and we showed that in vitro that, that you can produce this microenvironment. Remember, calcium, given just a little change in either pH or the amount of precipitate. The Because it was related just to that specific right, uh, viscoelastic, right? And right. Yeah. I'm telling you, right on the table. And then you put it in, you start pulling out, and boom, you see this calcification occur on your lens. And uh, um, uh, there's got to be some microenvironment mm. thing that's mm -hmm. happening in association with that. I mean, it's even more mysterious to me that they, you get gas in the back and it's happening in the front. That is but very somehow, weird. Thank you for yeah. Example and the breadth of lungs that's associated with it, mm. and who knows when some of these things can you know, turn to cancer. That's exactly, the that's the thing. Thank you for your comments, Dr. Olson. And I think to study those cases, we are going to help us to understand calcification a little bit better. Right. Even the other cases that we used to call destructive, because the causes of those are not yet completely understood. Okay, yeah. so I would like now to. Oh, sorry, sorry. Is something happening in the aqueous humor, I think? Um, some change, metabolic change, composition, um, blood aqueous barrier being ruptured, something, because it's only where it, it's in direct contact with the aqueous humor. That's why. So the cataraxis is in very, contact, um, uh, very close contact with the anterior surface. So I don't think there is much contact in the, in outside of the area of the opening of the cataraxis with the aqueous humor. So I think it's that. There's something happening in the anterior chamber content. It's just a subtle, I'll bet you, I'll bet yeah. you there's a shift in the pH. And all you need is a couple of hints to show that there is a precipitate or, or there's just a, a slight change in, in what's happening between the ratio of, you know, uh, phosphate, for instance, or, or any of the other anions. Or, but um, it, clearly there's, there's yeah. something that that's doing. It is very it difficult to, yeah. It's very difficult to determine because there were studies already where people trying to remove some aqueous humor and, and measure the composition and see what's different and everything. But it seems, as Dr. Um, also mentioned, it's something that's maybe happening very fast. We don't know exactly when. So it's difficult to catch those changes also. So. And what we were seeing in the operating room, Alan, you, you remember yeah. that. You showed you some of those cases. Literally, all of a sudden, you were there. You were getting ready. You had your lens. So we have two video presentations. So one is a video we sent last year, the other one uh, we sent this year. So I will start with this one. And that's about a problem that we also feel in our laboratories is a growing problem. It's about in the bag subluxation or dislocation mm -hmm. of intraocular lenses. 
and maybe it's because we are biased, but we are receiving a growing number of specimens related to that, that other people feel this is an increasing problem because in Europe this year, the ESCRF in Barcelona will have a whole symposium mm -hmm. only dedicated to the problem of in the bag um, dislocation. So this video got some awards last year in Brazil, in ESRS in London, so it was really cool. The American Academy has this session where they select a video to present and to discuss. This was selected, so we were very happy. And I take advantage to acknowledge everybody and uh, everybody in our lab works so much, so I'd like to thank them. And James Gilman provided some nice photos that he used in the video. The video is beautifully narrated by Paula Mori, the scholar here. Yeah, she's there. And of course, we cannot do those things without Randy Miller because we understand nothing about edition. <laughs> so <laughs> anyway, let me see if I can get that. Late spontaneous in the bag IOL dislocation is a dreadful complication which appears to be increasing in frequency. In this paper published in 2009 in the journal Ophthalmology, two specimens were sent to our laboratory before 2003. The other 84 came between 2006 and 2008. Later, we analyzed 23 other specimens containing capsular tension rings it became clear that the rings did not prevent late dislocation and also did not prevent capsular contraction or capsular rexosphymosis as we previously thought they might. Can late in the bag IOL dislocation be prevented? This video provides some useful preoperative and interoperative insights based on laboratorial and clinical experience. The primordial factor in this complication is zonular weakness. Different conditions predispose to zonular weakness, the most important being pseudo-exfiliation. In pseudo-exfiliation, abnormal extracellular material and metabolic proteins are deposited into different ocular structures, including the zonules, causing progressive zonular weakness. It is important during the clinical examination to look for signs of pseudo-exfoliation, which include abnormal material deposition on ocular structures, and iris transillumination defects. Direct signs of zonular instability include lens subluxation, zonular dialysis, iridodonesis, or phacodonesis. But other signs, such as asymmetry and anterior chamber depth between eyes, may also be indicative of impaired zonular function. Zonular strength is best assessed intraoperatively. Some useful signs include movement of the entire capsular bag during propagation of the rexus flap, sometimes exposing the zonular defect, and anterior capsule stria formation during performance of the capsular rexus, as observed here. In pseudoexfoliation, the capsular rexus should be as large as possible to prevent phimosis. A thorough hydrodissection is critical to enhance nucleus rotation minimizing stress on the zonules. Rotation should not be done as shown here away from the area of weak zonules. Rotation should always be done towards the area of weak zonules. Pre-chopping techniques decrease the energy released during the sculpting of the lens nucleus and facilitate phacoemulsification. We evaluated the ultra chopper in our laboratory using the Miyake Apple technique. This instrument was developed by Dr. Luis Escoff from Colombia. There is minimal stress added to the zonules while using the ultra chopper. For phacoemulsification, horizontal and vertical chopping techniques are usually the most zonular friendly. The traditional way of aspirating cortex is to pull fragments to the center of the capsular bag with centripetal movements, which may lead to zonular stress. 
tangential techniques, such as the hurricane technique evaluated in our laboratory from the Miyake Apple View, are more zonular friendly, however. Capsular support devices for intraoperative and postoperative support have been developed. In cases of significant zonular instability, iris or capsular retractors can be temporarily placed at the capsularexis edge to provide additional support during the entire surgery. We prefer capsular retractors. Regarding permanent devices, capsular tension rings are usually recommended in zonular dialysis up to 4 clock hours and or mild phacodonesis. In more advanced cases, a sutured device such as modified capsular tension rings, capsular tension segments, or a capsular anchor should be considered. Even after applying measures described here, late in the bag IOL dislocation may still occur. Its management depends on surgeon's preferences and specialty, type of intraocular lens, presence or not of a capsular tension ring, stage and site of dislocation, and coexisting ocular pathology. Surgical approaches described include different methods for repositioning or exchange of the intraocular lens. A recently described technique by Dr. Gary Condon simplifies the repositioning by making two incisions two millimeters posterior to the limbus. A 9 or 10 O proline suture is then passed externally through the IOL capsular bag complex and the needle is then exited through the peripheral cornea. A second instrument is passed through the second incision and then grasps the suture making a lassoed technique. This technique is much simplified compared to previous techniques and shortens the time of the surgery. Be prepared. You may have to deal with this complication in the near future. If you'd like to comment on this problem of dislocation, Dr. Olson also, I mean, do you see this as a growing problem also? You know, I think the point you made that um, dislocation is not absolutely preventative. And, and a lot of people have been saying you should get someone who's resigned with the acute exfoliation. You should put a capsular tension ring in all cases. And I think, you know, the, the lenses that we've seen in the lab with the beautiful impact yeah. now so on the ring. <laughs> I think part of the reason for decreasing problem is that quite certainly we can lock up on what we used to do tear apart in the past. We can't confirm what we're saying, but the underlying process is just very successful. It's very good. <coughs> I, I've seen cases and videos, I'm sure you have meetings, and I shake my head. I said, well, that's going to last about a year. <laughs> I actually have a question for you all because it seems in Europe it's much more frequent uh, that people explant everything and they like to put iris fixated lenses sometimes in the back of the iris or anterior chamber lenses. There are cases you do that or you just like to suture? Well, we're in the study for the So if it was available, you would rather do that yeah, in many well, cases? We, we may do it, but the great technique is really very easy. We don't have to worry about the corner and the plane coverage or whatever. I use 10 o poly lenses and they have all our programs and they work well. And I use them with some hundreds of lenses. Okay. 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 I have a lot of time. So, <coughs> but the other thing is, is you saw Gary with mm -hmm. it, which is great. The problem with the device is that he uses a one millimeter next side lens and it's like six centimeters deep. What I do is I use a Thank you. 
Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, because I saw that. I remember yeah. seeing that. I thought, wow, look at that. That's what you want. You don't need it that big. You don't need it that big. But mm-hmm. that was just such a pleasure to be able to look at any facility and, and uh, not see that larger. The snare is really slick. I mean, oh, in, in my series of one, Alan even taught me how to do it. Okay, so Nick is all excited about introducing the next video. He's sending to meetings this year and expecting some awards. This has never <laughs> been viewed before. <laughs> 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 the end yesterday, so we've really updated this since we sent it to Asterix. And so oh, this, is now, um, uh, this is uh, now uh, the yeah, hot Oh, yeah. And you all, if you go to ASRS, there is now the um, the video, the, the People's Choice Award. So you can, you can actually yeah. vote. So please do not forget to vote. Femtosecond laser assisted cataract surgery has several purported advantages. The combination of a controllable high frequency laser with advanced ocular imaging technology allows a high degree of precision. The laser can place accurate and predictable corneal wound and astigmatic correcting incisions. Precisely centered and sized capsulotomies are also possible. Nuclear softening with various combinations of linear, radial, and cylindrical patterns allows removal of the nucleus with decreased ultrasound power. Precise creation of the capsular rexus with no disruption of the zonules allows placement of the capsular rexus in the setting of a dislocated lens with weak zonules such as Marfan syndrome or in an eye with previous trauma. Anterior capsulotomies can also be created safely in intumescent cataracts. A combination of linear or radial incisions with the femtosecond laser and a manual pre-chopper allows removal of the nucleus with minimal phacomulsification energy. A grid or checkerboard type of pattern with the femtosecond laser softens the nucleus and allows a bowl and fold type of nuclear removal with very little ultrasound energy. Fresh human donor eyes were prepared for treatment using the Miyake Apple technique to allow for evaluation of the femtosecond laser treatment from a posterior view. 
A circular capsule of Rexus was completed utilizing relatively high laser power to allow laser penetration through the relatively thick donor eye cornea. <laughs> radial or pie-shaped pattern with concentric cylinders for nuclear fragmentation were initiated. Lack of nuclear movement and zonular stability throughout the laser treatment were noted. Precise corneal wound placement can be readily appreciated from this posterior view. A second study eye was again evaluated using the Miyake apple technique with the posterior view. Following successful capsulorexis, the nucleus was fragmented using a matrix or grid pattern with concentric cylinders and small cuboidal fragments. The posterior safe zone, denoted by the arrows in the OCT image, is clear from this posterior view. The lens is stable with no zonular movement during the laser treatment. There is a small pocket of gas breaking out from the nucleus into the posterior cortex with no disruption of the lens capsule. The research eyes were fixed and the anterior segments were stained with trichrome stain to evaluate the lens nucleus. Note the grid or matrix fragmentation pattern of laser treatment in the nucleus with a distinct clear or safe zone posteriorly with no disruption of the lens capsule or the posterior cortex. There has been breakthrough of gas both posteriorly and anteriorly. This higher powered histopathologic view highlights the precision of the pattern applied to the lens nucleus by the femtosecond laser. Femtosecond laser assisted cataract surgery is a promising new technology which will continue to evolve in the future, allowing safe removal of a cataract with a high degree of precision. May the femto force be with you. <laughs> It was not very easy. <laughs> That's very new. And the technique of Miyake preparation has to be largely changed to get that because yeah, you cannot do as size. usual. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like $500 an hour. Yeah, right. <laughs> Expensive <laughs> work. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks for your attention. Okay, thank you. <laughs>